Good morning and welcome to CSIS. I'm Steve Morrison. I direct the Global Health Policy Center here. We're thrilled today to be able to host this program with Ambassador Russell, with uh, uh, Baba Tunde Osotemehin, Executive Director of UNFPA, and with Keith Hansen, uh, Global Practices Vice President of the World Bank. Um, we've had an overwhelming response to this, to this event, um, uh, both online and those of you who are here today with us. And um, I think it's uh, quite remarkable, and it's real, real proof of the power uh, of the issues that are on the table that are going to be discussed here, and the power of the individuals that we've brought together, and the influence that they bring and their respective institutions bring in shaping, shaping progress and policy on these very important issues that we're going to hear about today. Um, uh, so we're very honored, and we're really thrilled to be able to, to do this. Um, the issues that we're going to discuss today around global women's uh, health, empowerment, status, um, all of these issues are very central to the work that we do here at CSIS. Um, and, and, and that work is pioneered and led by Janet Fleischman, who is going to open the program uh, with, with uh, some introductory remarks and, and introduce our speakers. I want to offer special thanks to Brie Bacchus for all the work that she's done in pulling this together, and, and, and uh, Carolyn Schrote, Travis Hopkins, Ryan Sickles, who helped us all in pulling this all together. So Janet, why don't you come on up and kick things off? Thank you all. Thank you, Steve, and thanks all of you for coming. We are so excited to have this great group together, uh, certainly our panelists and also a wonderful audience. We welcome the audience online as well. I think, as Steve said, the great turnout and interest in this event is a testament to the importance of these issues. So we're really thrilled to have you all here and look forward to a very, very fruitful discussion. U.S. policymakers, U.N. agencies, multilateral institutions have all increasingly recognized that advancing women's global health and gender equality is among the most pressing challenges of the 21st century. This has led to an exceptional proliferation of policies and goals, initiatives, and partnerships to address women and girls' health, development, and empowerment. The from the abduction of schoolgirls in Nigeria, to the rapes in India, to the abuses of women and girls in crises across the world, in Syria, Central African Republic, South Sudan, to mention a few. But there's also very good news. Growing evidence is demonstrating that focusing on women and girls, maternal health services, voluntary family planning, access to HIV services, education for girls, economic empowerment for women, preventing and responding to gender-based violence, not only are critical to improving health outcomes, but also produce substantive positive returns in terms of policy uh, poverty reduction, development, and economic growth. And high-level events, such as last week's summit in London on sexual violence and conflict, show the possibilities for international engagement on these issues. So this is really a pivotal moment to develop a comprehensive approach to women's health as a smart and strategic way to advance US interests in saving lives, promoting healthy families and communities, and protecting the rights of women and girls around the world. Despite the often polarized atmosphere here in Washington, this really has been an area of bipartisan cooperation. This includes the PEPFAR gender strategies that were initially developed under the Bush administration, and certainly the Obama administration's elevation of women's health and gender equality as a key foreign policy goal. Yet we also know that prioritizing women's health and gender equality is persistently vulnerable at home and abroad. In the United States, high-level leadership and bipartisan support will be necessary to keep up the momentum on policy and program implementation. And this extends to the U.S. partners in international and multilateral agencies, in national governments, and in civil society. In 2009, President Obama appointed the first ambassador at large for global women's issues, a post currently occupied by our keynote speaker today, Ambassador Kathy Russell, who now heads the State Department Office on Global Women's Issues. 
This office is designed to ensure that gender issues and the advancement of women and girls' rights are fully integrated into the formulation and conduct of U.S. policy. The Obama administration has built a strong foundation and created an enabling policy environment for women's global health and gender equality. Yet policy development on its own is not enough. The next step is to ensure that those policies are supported by political commitment and financial resources aimed at accelerating program implementation. We have a great program today. We will lead off with a keynote address by Ambassador Kathy Russell, who will discuss her vision for the Office of Global Women's Issues and her priority areas of focus. We will then turn to a roundtable discussion with Dr. Babatunde Asotimehen from UNFPA, uh, Keith Hansen from uh, the Vice President at the World Bank, and joined by Ambassador Russell. These leaders in women's health and empowerment will discuss how their institutions build on their respective investments and how they are strengthening the partnerships together, as well as addressing enduring gaps and challenges. So it is now my honor to introduce Ambassador Kathy Russell, our keynote speaker. For the past nine months, uh, Ambassador Russell has served as the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues. In that position, she has traveled to more than a dozen countries, including Panama, Afghanistan, Turkey, Japan, India, Israel, Jordan, China, and Nepal, to name a few. For the preceding four years, she served as Chief of Staff to Dr. Jill Biden at the White House. While the primary focus of that office was on military families and higher education, Ambassador Russell, Russell showed her deep commitment to women's issues by helping to drive the development of the administration's strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally, a huge task uh, involving interagency coordination on a massive scale, which led to the August 2012 executive order uh, against, uh, sorry, which led to the August 2012 executive order on preventing and responding to violence against women and girls globally and the strategy that holds that name. Ambassador Russell has a long history of activism on this issue. As a senior advisor to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on International Women's Issues, she helped draft the original Violence Against Women Act in 1994 as staff director to then Senator Joe Biden and then helped usher in the international version of that bill while one of his senior advisors in 2007. She's also served as staff director at the Senate Judiciary Committee, senior counsel to Senator Patrick Leahy, and associate deputy attorney general during the Clinton administration. Ambassador Russell, we welcome you. Lots of microphones here. We try not to get them in the way. Well, thank you so much, Janet. Thank you very much. Steve, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank um, CSIS for all the work you do. Uh, it promotes such important policy discussions. It's really an honor for me to be here. Um, and I really would like to thank my colleagues from the UNFPA and the World Bank. It's an honor to be here with both of you, both really prominent in your fields, and it's really a, an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you. So, Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues, it's a little bit of a mouthful. As Janet said, my job is really to advance the status of women and girls around the world, and, and to do that really as a, as a critical element of U.S. diplomatic efforts. Um, investing in women and girls, helping them unleash their potential, we, we believe it's important for two reasons. One, obviously, we think it's the right thing to do. But I think most importantly and critically, we think it's, it, it's the wise strategic thing to do and, and an important diplomatic effort on the part of the United States. Women, we believe, are critical to every issue we face, including security challenges like terrorism and weak rule of law, health challenges like HIV, AIDS, and infectious diseases, economic and security challenges, and democracy and governance challenges. Studies have shown that countries are more peaceful and prosperous when women are accorded full and equal rights and opportunities. I'd like to give you a sense of four areas where I hope to focus my time and effort over the next three years. The first, as Janet mentioned, is an area that I've spent a lot of time on in my career, gender-based violence. Uh, it's an issue that I think is just absolutely critically important. When I was at the White House, as, as Janet said, we worked on the first U.S. strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence, which 
uh, at, really was at the president's direction. It's something that he recognizes uh, as, as an important issue. He did as a, as a senator and, and certainly as president, something that he wanted us to, to work on and to really coordinate the efforts of the administration. We're now working to implement and make real the goals of that strategy. And this is an issue that I raise just consistently in my diplomatic efforts. And it's interesting because wherever I go, people introduce me and, and uh, know, know of the work that I've done. And, and so it's an issue that other countries are very interested in. And it's something where um, I think that we, we have an opportunity to say, you know, it's, it's an issue that is an, a problem in the United States. It's something we have not solved in the United States. So we come at it with a lot of humility, uh, but we say we have some uh, experiences to share. Uh, and I think many countries, most countries, uh, are very interested in our experiences, and it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to really work together on that. We know an estimated one in three women worldwide has been beaten, coerced into sex, or otherwise abused in her lifetime. In some countries, 70% of female populations are affected. And it's interesting because I say these numbers so often that, you know, I, I sometimes forget, but when you really think about these numbers, they are absolutely staggering. Um, intimate partner violence is the most common form of violence experienced by women globally. And as many as one in four women experience physical and or sexual violence during pregnancy, endangering both mother and child. Again, you know, really horrifying numbers. Further studies indicate the risk of HIV among women who have experienced violence may be up to three times higher among those uh, who have not. U.S. supports comprehensive efforts to prevent and respond to gender-based violence in all its form, whether in forms, whether in conflict or peacetime settings, including intimate partner violence, rape, harmful traditional practices such as child marriage or what are you know, loosely called traditionally harmful traditional practices, female genital cutting uh, and mutilation. This includes both diplomatic and development efforts, as I mentioned, and highlights our commitment to remain a global leader in addressing this global horrible scourge. This commitment is exemplified in the new Safe from the Start initiative, which many of you may have heard about, uh, to prevent and respond to gender-based violence in humanitarian emergencies worldwide. Its initial commitment of $10 million, which Secretary Kerry expanded last week at the conference um, that uh, Janet mentioned, will allow humanitarian agencies and organizations to hire specialized staff launch new programs and develop innovative methods to protect women and girls at the onset of emergencies around the world. And this is a problem, um, you know, again, it's, it's something many of you may have heard about, but we, we find over and over again in humanitarian settings that women, you know, in, in part because these uh, settings are so uh, unstable, but women end up in refugee um, camps or just in um, places like uh, tornado settings or um, uh, hurricanes and, and other destabilized situations, and women are so much more vulnerable to sexual violence and other forms of violence. And so we know that. It happens over and over again. But we are always in a little bit of a uh, game of catch-up of trying to deal with these problems. And so we're trying very hard to deal with these problems from the outset. Um, as I said last week, Secretary Kerry, um, at the Global Violence um, Summit, really made a powerful statement and talked about how we refused to, to tolerate rape as a tactic of war and intimidation and vowed that now was the time to banish sexual violence to the dark ages in the history books. Um, that conference brings me to my second focus, which is political participation and women, peace, and security. Despite comp comprising over 50% of the world's population, women continue to be underrepresented, grossly underrepresented in every aspect of political and public life around the world. Today, only 21% of the world's parliamentarians are women. There are 21 women either serving as head of state or head of government. Only 17% of government ministers are women, with the majority serving in the fields of education and health. And in many, many places, those ministries are, are very, very weak. Since 1992, women have represented fewer than 3% of mediators and 8% of negotiators to major peace processes. These are the places where decisions get made, and simply put, there just are not enough women in them. Women often raise issues that others have overlooked. They reach out to constituencies that others ignore and have unique knowledge that stems from their societal roles and responsibilities. 
women's participation affects the types of policy issues that are debated and decided in parliaments, local councils, and government ministries. In India, research showed West Bengal villages with greater representation of women in local panchayats saw an investment in drinking water facilities double that of villages with fewer women on local councils. This highlights that women raise issues that are important to them and their families. Seems obvious, right? Nowhere is this more critical than in countries like Afghanistan, where the voices of women leaders at the decision-making tables are essential to supporting a secure and stable future in their nation. The U.S. provides extensive support to bolster the participation of Afghan women in the political process. We've also advocated for the full participation of Afghan women during the recent presidential and provincial elections. Like millions of others around the world, we just watched the Afghan people show their commitment to a peaceful and democratic future for their country during the presidential runoff, and we're very pleased with initial reports that Afghan women, once again, turned out in very high numbers and, and turned out despite some real threats of, of violence. We know women's unique perspective is critical to peace building and post-conflict reconstruction. Women often suffer disproportionately during armed conflict. They often advocate most strongly for stabilization, reconstruction, and the prevention of further conflict. Peace agreements, post-conflict reconstruction, and governance have a better chance of long-term success when women are involved. According to research conducted by the International Crisis Group in Sudan, Congo, and Uganda, women who participate in peace talks often raise issues like human rights, security, justice, employment, education, and health care that are fundamental to reconciliation and rebuilding, and therefore to lasting and sustainable peace. This is why the United States provided training for Syrian women's civil society groups in negotiations, leadership, and conflict resolution, and why we advocated so strongly for the inclusion of women in the official delegations of the Geneva II negotiations in Syria. Third focus is adolescent girls, and this is um, an area that's a little bit new for our office, but I, it's, it's an area that is incredibly important to, to me personally, and, and I think it's an, an area that makes a lot of sense for our office. Um, perhaps some of you joined us yesterday. I, I spoke at Brookings um, about uh, the importance of secondary education for girls. Um, certainly all of you, and, and Janet mentioned this as well, the crisis in Nigeria has captured a lot of attention around the world. Um, we see that adolescent girls face a particular set of unmet needs, and addressing them is, is really a critical challenge. Healthy, educated, successful adolescent girls lead to healthy, educated, successful women, and ultimately communities and societies. Uh, one extra year of primary school boosts girls' eventual wages by 10 to 20 percent. An extra year of secondary school, 15 to 25 percent. A child born to a mother who can read is 50% more likely to live past age five. And a child raised by a mother who has been educated is more likely to be healthy, safe, and in school. But girls are especially vulnerable to certain threats. National Violence Against Children surveys from the Together for Girls Partnership, which is a tremendously important partnership that we are involved with, in four African countries reveal around one in three girls and one in seven boys reported experiencing sexual violence, and one in four girls report their first sexual experience happened unwillingly. Early and forced marriage is a significant issue for young and adolescent girls. There are more than 60 million child brides worldwide. One girl in three is married by 18, one girl in seven in developing country, countries marries is married before the age of, eight, of 15. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the health consequences of early marriage are severe and long-term. 15 to 19-year-olds are about 40% more likely to die due to medical complications from pregnancy and childbirth than young women aged 20 to 24. So adolescent girls are at an age, a very precarious moment in their development, a time when they are most vulnerable to early marriage, sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, and to dropping out of school. They and their parents will make decisions that will affect their lives and families for generations to come. But if we can ensure that more adolescent girls stay and graduate from quality secondary school, remain healthy, and avoid early marriage, 
in early pregnancy, they will indeed be on a course to a better life and positively influence the lives of future generations. And because of these investments, countries will be more stable and more prosperous. The fourth and final focus is to continue the momentum on women's economic empowerment efforts. I'd like to spend a few minutes on this issue because as leaders around the world now understand, economic empowerment presents a real oppor opportunity to address so many of the issues facing women today. Recently, President Obama told the assembled houses of Congress that when women succeed, America succeeds. Secretary Kerry, too, knows how important women's empowerment is to any country's growth and security. So what do we know about women and the economy? First, we know several of the there are several barriers to women's economic empowerment. Many of them are the very challenges I've been discussing. Inadequate education, high incidences of gender-based violence, and widespread gaps in health services. These issues are all connected, and in some ways, talking about them separately is, is I think, a little bit artificial. Other impediments strike at the heart of economic activity. The Women, Business, and the Law report indicates that one of 143 economies surveyed, 128 make at least one legal distinction between genders that impact women's ability to participate in the economy. For example, legal barriers and cultural norms in many countries inhibit women from accessing capital. In developing economies alone, these barriers result in a 260 to $320 billion credit gap for women-owned small and medium enterprises. This is not only a missed market opportunity for financial institutions, but also an enormous constraint on women's ability to achieve the financial wherewithal to grow a business, raise crops, or protect against shocks. Second, we know the benefits of removing these barriers. This is important because of the profound impact that economic empowerment can have not only in the lives of, billion of billions of women and girls around the world, but also on their families, their communities, and their nations. Growth in women's entrepreneurship boosts economies and rising numbers of women on the factory floor, in the boardroom, improves the health of economies. Many of these benefits accrue to the women themselves. Women who take home dependable pay from decent jobs are better equipped to provide for themselves and more likely to stand up for their rights. And investing in women also produces a multiplier effect. Women spend the majority of their earnings on local products and services that strengthen communities and on food, schooling, and immunizations that help secure their children's futures. At the macroeconomic level, countries can realize significant gains from focusing on leveling the playing field for women. The OECD found that the narrowing gap between male and female employment has accounted for a quarter of Europe's economic, or I'm sorry, annual GDP growth over the past two decades, and that closing gender gaps in the labor market in the Middle East and North Africa could increase per capita GDP in that region by more than 25%. The UN found that the Asia-Pacific region loses upwards of $89 billion in GDP each year due to restrictions on women's ability to fully participate in the economy. Finally, we know that impediments to women's full participation in the economy are faced by women in all parts of the world, by women in least developed countries and G20 countries alike. Last November, I traveled to Japan the world's third largest economy with the vice president. I saw firsthand how Prime Minister Abe is trying to remove constraints on women fully joining the workforce to boost his nation's economic performance. Not only did he recognize such steps made common sense, he also saw they made good business sense for the businesses in his country and also good economic sense for his country. Our challenge is to go from what we know and from where we are to action to find out where we, my office, State Department, the UN, the World Bank, add value, which is not always an easy question because there are a lot of players in the field. A whole of government, in fact, a whole of international community approach is needed to advance the economic empowerment of women and girls. Such an approach will require a variety of partnerships, strategic dialogues, and public diplomacy and outreach. We're working to develop toolkits that our embassies and forward-thinking governments or civil society groups can use to drive positive change. 
Such an approach will leverage the established international fora that have already turned an eye toward economically empowering women, such as the G20 and APEC, and we'll look to see how we can enhance those efforts. The G20 is very focused on increasing female labor force participation, and APEC, after successfully elevating the strategic importance of women in the economy through high-level policy dialogues that began in 2011, is moving towards regional action to support the consensus achieved in these dialogues. And this is really just the beginning. Gains made in a regional forum like these can and should be transferred to other regions. APEC really is a leader in this, in this respect. Such an approach will allow us to draw on private sector engagement. With the private sector supplying the largest number of jobs in most countries, the importance of working with them to establish gender equality throughout internal and external business operations is crucial. However, women make up the majority of the informal sector and unpaid workforce, and we really need to ensure that our efforts make, take this segment of the population into account. Such an approach will also convene new multi-member partnerships in support of women's economic empowerment. Over the past few years, the State Department has played a role in creating several key partnerships. The Equal Futures Partnership is an important initiative of the President's designed to drive action by member countries to empower women economically and politically. The Alliance for Artisan Enterprise is a public-private partnership through which companies, nonprofits, governments, and international organizations collaborate and grow artisan enterprises. Both programs are terrific examples of what can happen when public and private sector stakeholders come together. And they demonstrate the commitment of the United States and other countries to continue to support the economic empowerment of women. I'd like to close with just a, an example of a program I heard about when I was in India that showed how empowering women to participate in the economy has a real and lasting impact. While I was there, I, I met a woman who started something called the Wheel, Women on Wheels campaign, which trains women for jobs in the, as drivers in um, trucks, taxis, and personal limousines, which is very, very unusual in, in India. What I truly appreciate about the Azad Foundation's work to recruit and train these women was the many ripple effects of their efforts. The trainees participate in modules on health and first aid because the foundation recognizes that when women and their families are healthy, it benefits both the women and the companies that hire them. In families where the total household income was formerly 3,000 to 5,000 rupees per month, the women alone are now earning between 7,000 and 12,000 rupees per month, which changes the whole dynamic in the family. It really is a significant change. In communities where women's freedom was limited by the fear of gender-based violence in cars or on the streets, women who take the wheel help dozens of others access markets and much needed services. And that too is a significant change. So in all of these areas, gender-based violence, women peace and security, adolescent girls, and women's economic empowerment, I think we have a pretty good idea of what works and what the path forward looks like. So we only need to keep committing ourselves and recruiting others to join us in the effort. The president likes to quote Martin Luther King, who famously said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And you know, I, I, I sometimes think in my job that there are many days when I hear things from women who suffer just horrible, horrible uh, incidences of violence or injustice. And there are moments when you really have to wonder about what makes people do the terrible things they do and are we really seeing progress? Can we really make a difference? But I always think about what the president says and I think that it's true for women as well. And I think that overall things are moving in a really positive direction and that we do have a very good idea of how to move things forward and that we have a lot of people who are pushing uh, and pulling and working on our side to do it. And so I think if we can all continue to work together with amazing partners like we have here, we will continue to see real progress. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it and I look forward to it. So I'm going to invite the other panelists to come join us on the stage.
working? Everybody can hear me? Is this on now? Okay. Well, thank you all, and thank you so much, Ambassador sure. Russell, for setting the, the stage for our discussions today. It's a wonderful moment to be able to look at where we've come from and what some of the opportunities are going forward. And we have this distinguished panel to discuss this in a broader international context now. And what we'd like to do is allow Keith Hansen and Babatunde Asoti Mehen to give brief opening remarks of just a couple of minutes, three to five minutes. And then we will have a moderated discussion here about some of the issues raised and some of the questions that we'd like to explore. And then we'll open it up to Q&A from the audience. So let's begin with Dr. Asoti Mehen. Thank you, Janet. And, uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, let me start by thanking um, our Excellency the Ambassador for um, very enlightening opening remarks. And uh, I take note of uh, your strategies in terms of uh, the gender-based violence, uh, the political participation, adolescent girls, and economic empowerment. I think that they're very powerful entry points to uh, actually get to women and girls around the world. And, and I, would, uh, I would take this further and talk about some aspects of, of the work that we do, which uh, are coterminous with uh, what, what you're trying to do. And we'd like to thank everybody, including the World Bank, for the partnership which we have and which we've been able to uh, foster uh, even more in the last uh, uh, one year. Right now, let me start by <clears throat> speaking to you about a young girl, a 10-year-old, most likely living in a remote areas in India and Africa, who has been forced to leave her home and to get married to some 62-year-old man who she's never met before. And uh, You imagine that that day, our childhood ends, and she disappears from statistics. Nobody knows. She actually totally disappears. And there are millions of such women in the world. In fact, every two seconds, a girl like that, under 18, is married up. And uh, we have about 50 million girls in the world who give birth every year. And that's not so much uh, the problem. The problem is that we actually then have a good number of them. Sometimes in countries, 40% of them actually die giving birth. And twice as num that number actually have morbidities from uh, giving birth. So in a sense, we, we see uh, the issue of empowerment of women from a different perspective, and gender-based violence as, uh, as Kathy has said, is, is a global issue. Uh, it, it's, it's all over. And we see that in the last few years, there has been quite uh, a number of incidences around the world that has called attention to this and has brought it to center stage. So let me now concentrate on some of the things that I believe we need or we do at UNFPA, which actually can, uh, can, can begin to work with what uh, Cathy has said in terms of how <coughs> we can empower women uh, going forward. I, I, I wanted to, uh, what if there's anything that uh, I wanted to take away from here today is that whatever we do, either empowerment of women in terms of economic empowerment or trying to get them to go to school or make, making them stay in school, or trying to get them to take contraception or whatever, it will work for, a, for some level of empowerment. But the total empowerment of women is what we do in our communities, raising, raising the status of women. So the status of women is what is the problem everywhere. And we have to understand that. If we do not raise the status of women, we're not going anywhere. I'll give you one simple story. And I think that would contextualize what I mean. 
I was Minister of Health in Nigeria, and I visited a hospital. When I got there, I saw this woman who was in labor. And I've been in labor for 36 hours, and I, as a physician, I said, so what are you doing about this? And uh, uh, they said, oh, you know, they, nobody was prepared to pay for cesarean section. And, and I thought, that is totally unacceptable. So I ordered that the cesarean section should be, uh, should be performed. Unfortunately, she and her baby died. But that's not, in fact, the saddest part of the story. The saddest part of the story was that I asked, oh, so where's the husband? And I was told the husband came and abandoned her because uh, she's supposed to be carrying an evil spirit. And mm -hmm. that's why she cannot deliver that baby. And so she, as far as she's, he's concerned, it's a commodity. He's left her. He's going to go marry another woman in that same community. So in a sense, how, what we do in every possible way of empowerment has to mm -hmm. deal with the status of women in our communities and how we raise the status. Because if we don't get gender parity, if we don't address the issue of gender parity, no matter what we do, even when girls have the same education as boys, they don't get the same opportunities. Even when they have in fact, better education, they don't get the same opportunities. And I think that, and, and when you talk about political participation, it's the same thing. You know, you, you, you end up in a situation where women and girls are, you know, are not treated as equal partners in development. I think that we need to deal with that. Now, let me come back to the issues that we deal with, uh, UNFPA, to a, a greater extent. We think, and we believe, today, there are more than 200 million women in the world who want family planning. They are not getting it. Now, th those are the ones that want it. But going beyond that, we also believe that family planning and contraception is actually more empowering than just reduction of fertility or fertility uh, control. You see, when a girl, the 10 year old I spoke to you about, if she was allowed to stay in school and, uh, and go through school and and uh, through graduate school, she would actually be 25. She would have started her periods at the age of 12 or 13, and she would end up 25. So there's 12 years of exposure. Now, the truth of the matter is that we can, and parents like me sometimes think that girls don't get to do things which they're not expected to do when they're not married, but they, they actually do. They don't. They don't <coughs> They don't sit around crossing their legs. They go around and they do things. And I think the reality of it is that we then need to ensure that they have comprehensive sexuality education. We must ensure that they have access to information and services. We must ensure that they have access to family plan now, or contraception. Now, the truth of the matter, and, I, and that's the point I want to make, when you do that, what you have done is actually build an agency in that girl. So that girl becomes an independent person. She can then decide what she wants to do, who she wants to get married to, or not marry, how many children she wants to have, or not have children, when she wants to have them, and what distance between them. So, so in a sense, what you've done is you've created an independent person who can then take this together. And, and so it goes far beyond fertility regulation. It's about the individual. It's about building an individual that is able to take decisions about their life. So contraception goes in that direction. Now, of course, when you then look at this in the context of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, conflict, it's even worse. That is that these girls and women are forced into a conflict situation. The face, the face of conflict is the face of, of a woman or a girl who is frightened, who is running away from war or from a humanitarian situation. And in those kinds of circumstances, UNFP stands there making sure that we provide them not only safe spaces, we also provide them contraception so that they do not, because, you know, we conducted a survey 40% of the, of the men in that survey actually said there's nothing wrong in raping a woman. 40%. Now that, you know, so we need to deal with the judicial part of that, but 
But you know the consequences. You know, they, they get pregnant, they get uh, HIV, and all of those. So we need to deal with that. And I think that the, the aspect of it which we bring to the table and which we ensure uh, that you know, women and girls can continue to be who they want to be is, is ensuring that they are safe, is ensuring that they are protected, is ensuring that they can be participants in development in their communities and their nations. And I'll just end by one simple statistic. There are two million women, are there are two million young people in the world today. 600 million of them are young adults and girls. Now, can you imagine? Imagine a world, just imagine it, where every adult and girl actually goes, gets to go to school, stays in school, takes a master's degree. It's able, it's protective for gender-based violence. Can actually choose in terms of who to marry, when to marry. Can decide when to have children, not to have children. Can decide to go to parliament or not to go to parliament. Can decide to get employment or not get employment. Can become an entrepreneur and can create jobs. Imagine the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that's very important to start imagining a world and figuring out what do we have to do to get there. And one of the things that's very interesting is the way the World Bank is now engaging on these issues in a new way at new levels. And I'd like to turn it over to you, Keith, to be able to talk a little bit about the World Bank's role and how things are changing at the bank. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much to CSIS for hosting and highlighting this. Thank you, Ambassador, for your excellent comments and to uh, Dr. Elsa Chairman, um, who as always has really put an urgent um, sense of importance to this and the peer leadership, both of you. Um, I want to start by saying there's obviously profound intrinsic value and imperative to doing these things. Uh, the stories that we hear shock the conscience and everyone deserves the opportunity to develop to their fullest potential for their own sake as a matter of human dignity. Um, and I, this is important to bear in mind at all times. However, at the same time, beyond being the right thing to do, um, in investing heavily in achieving the full potential of women is also excellent economics. Um, and I don't want to boil this down to dollars and cents, but often when countries are looking for where to invest scarce resources, it does become a discussion of where they're going to get higher return. And so it's important that we go in armed with both kinds of arguments. And this is what people turn to the World Bank to do. The bank has recently renewed its mission and restructured itself to become more relevant and more effective um, for this generation. And we have committed ourselves to two explicit goals. One is to eradicate extreme poverty by the year 2030, and the other is to boost shared prosperity. Both of these are going to be measured and tracked in a continual basis. Obviously, the bank alone does not control these outcomes, so it's not about whether we uh, can change poverty all by ourselves. It's rather about how well the bank works with the, uh, the countries that we exist to serve and with all of our partners in the bilateral, multilateral institutions, foundations, et cetera, to work toward that goal. And um, gender equality and women's opportunity matters immensely to the bank group because we cannot succeed in achieving these two goals unless we achieve everything the ambassador and the professor have talked about this morning. It is impossible. Uh, gender equality is not just smart economics, it is imperative economics. There are tremendous economic costs associated with inequality. Um, the first is sheer economic inefficiency. When you are systematically thwarting, stunting, and obstructing the development of half your population, to use the spirit of the World Cup at the moment, you are scoring an own goal against <laughs> your own development prospects every day of every week of every year. Um, and there is no way you can achieve that. You are basically taking half the population and putting them to one side and trying to get by with half your potential talent pool. Um, just the arithmetic alone is very clear, and the empirical evidence uh, is overwhelming on this. Second, there's a huge intergenerational cost um, to inequality. Um, as the ambassador mentioned, there are clear direct effects of an individual woman's achievement in education and 
um, ability to control her fertility with the outcome of her children. But because of the central role that women play in the social fabric, there's also intriguing evidence that the average, the average level of education of women in a community affects the development prospects of each of their children, even if the mother of that particular child had a lower than average education. Because of the social norms that develop, the opportunities, the spaces that come, those children actually have better chances as a result of that. And third, uh, the exclusion of women from decision-making bodies, from norm setting, from institutions, um, results in what economists call suboptimal outcomes. Less is invested than should be in crucial services, um, less is invested in children, things like basic water, sanitation, education do not achieve the same level of attention or investment that they should. These three things together represent a powerful and almost insuperable obstacle to achieving development outcomes. Conversely, getting these things right can open up huge opportunities. Um, the bank has estimated, and working with others, that uh, employment segregation by gender alone, that ending this could increase labor productivity by anywhere from 3% to 25%. There is no technological miracle or organizational stunt we could pull to increase labor productivity by 25%. I mean, this is on the order of you know, a revolution. And being able to achieve that simply by opening the doors to half the population um, is a tremendous opportunity uh, that many countries around the world still have sitting before them like a golden bowl that they can claim. Increasing the share of assets that women own and control, um, we know leads to better uh, health for their children, better nourished children, children more likely to be in school and to learn in school, which is even more important. Um, and so again, has this intergenerational impact that then of course ramifies um, to that girl's development prospects as she becomes a woman um, and enters the labor force and becomes a, um, a member of uh, adult society herself. Um, reducing exposure to gender-based violence obviously opens up a whole set of opportunities as well. So all of these things work together to create far more economic chances and opportunities. But addressing this means we have to go about this in a different way than we have been. Um, to date, um, much of the development agenda has focused on individual interventions, individual commodities, individual opportunities. And as the ambassador mentioned, it's very clear now these things are really interlocking and they happen far, far upstream. It's not a matter of just opening a new clinic or providing a new form of um, medicine or getting a new textbook somewhere. It's really have to look at the whole ecosystem of things that either induce or obstruct girls and women's access to services. The clinic is no good if there's no decent road to get there, or if the road isn't safe, or if the woman isn't allowed to travel on her own, or whatever it may be. The school is no good if the girl is embarrassed to be there during her menstrual cycle and is not allowed to be there and therefore misses crucial parts of school during the year. A whole host of things have to go together. And so in the World Bank group, we are now moving our attention far upstream and we're trying to look at much more multifactorial determinants um, of what drives opportunities and outcomes, um, as well as the crucial norms um, and opportunities for agency that really uh, determine whether women can take part or not. We're also trying to improve the evidence base. Um, we simply don't know enough. We don't have gender disaggregated data for many crucial development outcomes. Um, a large share of the poorest countries do not even have functioning vital statistics systems. We don't know who's being born, who's dying, where or when. It's very difficult to do good programming without this. So there's an urgent agenda to improve evidence, both in its raw form and its curated and interpreted form um, to make progress on this. Um, on the bank side, what we have done is we reorganized ourselves in order to better serve these two overarching goals that we're trying to meet. We have put all of our technical practices together now under one vice presidency to remove any potential barriers to working together, given that most development challenges are actually multi-sectoral in nature. Um, and in addition to that, we've built in a cross-cutting group to focus on gender, not as an add-on, but as a built-in. And the whole point of this group is to stimulate uh, the, in, the integration of a gender uh, focus in the work that all of these different sectors do. So not just the traditional ones, such as health and education, uh, but ones like energy and transport, to say what are the gender dimensions of the energy policies that countries are developing? Are these differentially affecting uh, women in the negative or in the positive? What can we do at this level? What about macro and fiscal policy? There are very important things that can be done in the financial sector to enhance women's opportunities. But all these things need to be seen as of a piece, mutually reinforcing 
and sequenced in a way that's going to unlock opportunity as much as possible. Um, and we're very excited about the possibilities that this will create. These new structures will begin on July 1st, and we're going to be moving very aggressively um, both to, um, to measure and to uh, disseminate the knowledge of what's happening as we try to move gender farther upstream, farther up the agenda, um, and put it to, uh, much more at the center of what we're trying to achieve overall. Just as one example, during a trip to the Sahel last fall, uh, the president of the bank, Dr. Jim Kim, along with the UN Secretary General, committed $200 million um, for women and girls in the Sahelian region. Six countries working in league with UNFPA, the European Union, the African Development Bank, the African Union, um, looking both at things like uh, reproductive health commodities and training centers, but also on things to boost voice and agency, um, empower, uh, in, enacting the lessons of the Adolescent Girl Initiative on scaling up multi-sectoral programs uh, to empower adolescent girls, income generation, skills building, training activities, recognizing that this is part and parcel um, of making progress in these areas. So they're also going to strengthen the Sahelian Center of Excellence to develop the evidence base and the skills to evaluate the evidence to see what's working and what isn't and share that with other regions. So this is just one example of the more integrative approach that the bank group working with our partners is trying to take moving forward on this because this is, uh, again, not just an urgent agenda but an imperative one uh, because otherwise we're not going to achieve um, the goals all of us hold dear um, and that we need if we want to see this become the development century and truly eradicate poverty once and for all. So thank you for having us. Well, thank you to all of you because I think you have highlighted a number of the key issues that we'd like to now explore. Uh, and there's so many we won't have time for it all, but maybe I can start with Ambassador Russell. Uh, we've, we've talked a lot about the importance of collaboration and you have your own experience with, in the US government itself, the interagency process. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how your office works with the other parts of the US government, the other agencies, in promoting the issues of women's health and empowerment. Uh, how do you work with PEPFAR? How do you work with PMI? Even the, the PRM office at State Department. Mm -hmm. What role does your office play in coordinating those efforts? Well, I think um, it, it, it really is the purpose of our office, honestly, is to, is to try to, to bring, bring all of these offices, all of these efforts into some sort of coordinated effort. And when I was at the White House, as you said, we, we worked on, on bringing the, all the offices and entities in the U.S. government who are working on gender-based violence together. It is no small task. It's a really big government, and there are lots of entities that are, that are working on these efforts. And you know, it can be the case that even in our own small office, there are people who are working on things, and you may not know who's doing something right next to you. And it, it, it's just the, it's, the, it's the way the government works. It's the way any big organization works. It's very challenging. So the first task is really trying to, to really get a, a, to survey people and to try to understand who's doing what. Um, we spend a lot of money on these efforts. Uh, and so we really are trying to do our very best to say, look, we're all in a time of limited resources. Let's, let's understand what we're doing. Let's make the best use of these resources. Let's look for partners. Let's understand what the bank is doing, what every other countries are doing. Let's make sure that we are trying to make the best use of everybody's um, efforts and expertise so that we can coordinate as best po as possible. But we work incredibly closely with all of our colleagues at the State Department, PEPFAR, all of these organizations. And, and everybody is very much on the same page. Um, so it's really a, an unbelievably positive collaboration. But it's, I can't underestimate how challenging it is. So, yeah, you laugh because you know. <laughs> yes. But I will say this, I think as, just as you were talking, I mean, I think we're all in, on the same page in terms of what we're trying to do and how we see the importance of looking at these issues in a really um, comprehensive way. And I think that that really seems to be where, where the bank is, where our friends at DFID are, where, where really everybody is at this point. I think a, a real understanding that you can't look at any of these issues in isolation. And that understanding, I think, is really critical. One of the areas that I think all of you work on in different ways is the challenge of how do you engage men and boys? Mm -hmm. And where are there examples, the sort of positive examples of impact in that area? And Dr. Sotimehan, maybe you want to talk a little bit about some of what you've seen in your work of how you can really begin to engage men and boys uh, to further uh, access to contraception, to family planning, 
for women and girls? Thank you very much. I, I think that uh, fundamentally, the global community needs to engage with boys at very young, at a very young age. That, I think that's a very important thing. And I would like to suggest that um, comprehensive sexuality education and skills development of boys and girls in the same class are very important because that is what is going to build a young man who is going to be gender sensitive. Um, I've seen it work, and I think that will encourage it to happen uh, across the board. That's the first. The second, of course, is that in a very practical way, uh, UNFPA has been working with boys and men as partners in many parts of the world. And I'll give you one example. Uh, it's an example in Nigeria Republic where we, we constructed what we call husband school. And we brought together men in communities and, and in particular community, we bring together the Muslim cleric, the Christian cleric, the civil servant, the husband, and, uh, and the or married man. And they will sit, and uh, there will be a mentor who will take them through some of the issues that we deal with in terms of why women must have access to several things, including education, including health services, including contraception and including the ability to generate income for themselves. And, and what we've seen is an incredible uh, positive result from that. One, we found that in those communities, maternal mortality went down. We found that uh, uh, child mortality went down. We also found out that there was an increase uh, in the acceptance of contraception. So in a sense, uh, if, you, if you work with men, and you engage them in a very direct way, uh, making them the sustainable uh, proponents of, of uh, women's empowerment and development, you actually get uh, uh, quite a, a, uh, quite a, a substantial uh, uh, benefit from it. Now, I'll end by just giving you a quick story. When I started this job uh, in 2011, um, the, the permanent representatives who are, women, who are women, the women permanent representatives in New York said, uh, it's not possible that an African man can run UNFPA. Mm. Because how, they actually wanted to ask me, what do I know about child rearing? So I, I went to this meeting, lunchtime meeting, and I sat there and, um, and uh, they started asking questions. Uh, couldn't even eat the lunch. But by the time we finished, they said, oh, OK, we are satisfied with you. I think you understand what the sensitivities of these are. So from today, you are an honorary woman. <laughs> so, so what we need to do is to make every man an honorary woman. So. <laughs> Keith, we can make you an honorary woman, too. <laughs> um, so you, you talked a little bit about the data gaps. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you're improving the gender-related data through the bank's work, and what methods you've developed to address these gaps. Uh, first, I have to say, it's not just up to the World Bank to do this. I mean, this is, has to be a vast, coordinated effort. One problem we have at the moment is most of the partners, the countries, and the professor will remember this from his days as a minister, all are coming in asking for their own measurement systems, their own indicators, and it is really sapping the time and crucial attention of policymakers in the countries that are trying to deliver these programs. So the first thing we need to do is get our own houses in order as the development partners. Um, and to that end, we're looking at, as I said, starting with the basics. There's now an um, initiative underway to try to uh, align around developing vital statistics systems around the world. We are looking at how quickly we can move to more gender disaggregated data. Um, we are looking at trying to find, measure a broader range of things, not just access to given services, but represent, presence and representation in decision-making bodies and unofficial representation 
and so forth. Um, and again, this is part of the integration agenda, working across the different uh, technical practices. So uh, in energy, for instance, looking at you know, access to healthier forms of energy other than indoor cook stoves, things like this that we know are contributing to the problem and yet we're not finding. And it's amazing when you get uh, different kinds of people, different kinds of expertise into the room, just the different perspectives help shed new light on what we have all accepted as the right way of measuring something and suddenly you realize, well, if that's the right way, why is there no correlation between that and this outcome over here? And you realize, ah, because there's a missing link and this is what needs to be measured. And we're finding more and more of those in, in gender and a number of other areas. So it's an exciting agenda. It's one that's made much easier now by the uh, smartphone revolution. I mean, soon everybody on Earth will be actually be able to provide data um, even without trying to, simply by clicking in when they do something or show up at a clinic. And this creates a fantastic opportunity now to begin to see things that previously would have been, um, you know, just impossibly expensive to get at. But it also creates a responsibility to do so because this is the only way we'll really know that we're making headway. Did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add something, and I think that we owe this to the World Bank. Um, sometime last year, uh, Jim Kim, the president, and the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Ban Ki-moon, actually did a memorandum of understanding to try and put together all UN agencies that actually produce data, the World Bank and regional banks, and try to create a, a kind of unified position for big data. And I think that is slowly grinding up, and I think we believe uh, that's one thing that would change the face of data around the world. Uh, and I think it's important because uh, as we go forward, uh, looking at development and looking at measurements, uh, data is probably the most important. I know that we want to open it up for questions. I wish we had so much more time, but I'd like to ask Ambassador Russell just quickly, since you were just at the London Summit, mm -hmm. Um, if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the specific new things that the U.S. Uh, put forward at that summit uh, in terms of some of the justice issues and other mm -hmm. areas. You mentioned the Safe from the Start expansion, mm -hmm. but maybe you could just mm -hmm. tell us quickly what some of the new things uh, advanced by the U.S. Sure. Um, I think the, the main new thing that we did, we, as you said, we did do an expansion of Safe from the Start, which I think is incredibly important. We also expanded, we have a fund that we've made available for victims of sexual violence that our embassies can apply for. So if a victim comes in uh, and, it, and it, it, it comes up, it's something that the, our embassies asked us to do where it, sometimes if somebody will come in and it's a horrific case and they don't have any way to help the victim. So we have a fund that's available for those people and there was an expansion of that fund. We also set up something called our Accountability Initiative. And that is an expansion of, you know, we have something in, um, that we're doing now in the DRC where we have um, a mobile court initiative. And, um, and we, we are doing those for a couple reasons. One, because we've seen in these conflict situations that finding justice for victims is, is incredibly challenging to do. Um, and, you know, we, we, I've met with victims who are just, I mean, first of all, the, the forms of violence are horrific and victims believe that the people who do this to them will never serve any just, you know, serve any time for what they do and that they will never pay any price for it. And this sense of impunity is horrible on the, on the part of the people who perpetrate and also for the victims who suffer it. Um, so the DRC now has these, these mobile courts and we're, we're supporting them and we go in and we train Congolese judges, prosecutors and defense lawyers and that courts travel around so that people in communities can actually see justice being served. And so now, really the only recourse, for the most part, that we have is that people have to take case, cases to The Hague, which is, you know, we have some body of law being developed there, but it's a very challenging way to prosecute cases. And you can only do a few cases, you can't do many cases there. So this serves a couple purposes. One, you, people can see justice being served. And two, and very importantly, we see it as a way to start to build up the legal systems in some of these countries, which we think ultimately can be incredibly important. So the mobile courts are one example, but there are other alternative ways of doing this. You can have 24-hour courts and other ways that we can start to build up these legal systems, which we think is incredibly important. The other announcement that the, the Secretary made is that and this is something we're very excited about. It's a little um, inside baseball, but it's in, incredibly important from our perspective, which is that the, the Secretary, and I think it's actually going out today, is an, um, issuing the new gender guidance in the State Department. And um, 
And the way that works in the State Department is the Secretary will issue guidance for how he wants embassies and bureaus um, to do work on certain issues. And, and so far, he's issued his first guidance, which was on climate. Uh, and it, it certainly reflects his um, you know, priorities. He'll, he'll issue several guidance, kinds of guidance over his, his time in office. Um, but gender was his second, which we were really delighted about. And it, he um, it really sets out what his priorities are and what he wants embassies to do in this respect. And I think it really establishes how important this issue is to him and how, um, how much he wants embassies to, to really integrate this work into their daily activities and how critical it is from his perspective and what a high uh, priority he sees it as. So we're really very excited about that. Uh, and I think that was the, oh, the visa ban challenge is the, is the other thing he did, which is um, he talked about this. He, he earlier this year um, has made it clear that in the United States we have a, a ban. He's, he's issued a ban on visas for um, people who perpetrate or allow um, egregious sexual violence in their countries. We're uh, not allowing them to come to the United States. And he um, encouraged other countries to do the same thing. And he sort of challenged other countries to do the same and said that he, there shouldn't be safe harbors for these countries, any, these people anywhere in the world. And it was really interesting because we realized we didn't understand this before we got to London, but that most countries don't have that visa ban for these perpetrators. So it was really important. And I think for him to, to come to London uh, was very powerful. He made the final statement. He got a standing ovation. People were really excited to see American leadership on this issue, and he just was really powerful and, and quite impressive. So it was tremendous to see him there. So I'm conscious of the time, so I do want to open it up because I'm sure we have a very informed audience, uh, and I, I know you have questions. Please identify yourself. Wait for a mic that will be brought around so that the folks on the webcast will be able to hear you. And we'll take maybe a group of three questions uh, at a time. And if you want to address it to someone in particular, you can uh, make that known. So we'll start over there. Do we have mics? Here comes a mic. Hi. Thank you all for uh, this great presentation this morning. And thank you specifically for raising the issue of adolescent girls. Uh, too often, girls are left off the global agenda. Hopefully, next time we have this event, it'll be titled Global Women's and Girls Issues. Um, we need to just keep stressing the importance of girls. So I'm Suzanne Petroni. I'm with the International Center for Research on Women. ICRW is also co-chair of Girls Not Brides USA. And I want to ask a question uh, to Ambassador Russell. As you know, the Violence Against Women Act last year that Congress passed had a mandate for the State Department to have a strategy to prevent child marriage. I know that a strategy may not be the, doing more strategies over and over may not be what, uh, what folks want to do, but I wonder if you can tell us what role you have played and what role the State Department has played in developing a, a better coordinated, well-funded uh, plan, strategic approach for ending child marriage that's government-wide. Um, well, it's interesting because, you know, I used to work on the Hill, as I said, so when I was on the Hill, I believe that um, the executive branch should be writing all sorts of strategies, and now that I'm in the executive branch, I'm like, oh, for the love of Pete, all we have to do is write strategies. <laughs> Having said that, I do, I'm a big believer in strategies, honestly, because I think that, um, and I always say this to my team, I think we need to wake up every morning and know exactly what we're doing, because honestly, I, I feel the, the, the sort of weight of time while I'm there, and I feel like we have so little time to get our work done, and it needs to be very clear how we're gonna get this done. So in terms of um, child marriage, as I said, we are, we ha we are, um, I, I'm reluctant to say this, but we, we have a strategy that we're, I wouldn't say we're ready to put it on, out yet, but we, we have, we have, um, we are, the way I am working on this, because of this, the way I see this, is an adolescent girl strategy. And that it, it is a, I, I see this as an issue that includes girls' education and child marriage. I think those issues are totally linked. I, I want to treat them similarly. Um, as I said earlier, I, I, I think all the issues are linked, but I, I and so I'm, I'm loath to divide any of them, but I really think that those two issues are linked and we're approaching those two things as, as really one comprehensive issue, and it is looking at adolescent girls. Um, and so we are 
really in the, in the throes of getting that done. And so it is really a top priority for us. So I, I'm not giving you exactly what you want, but I really want to reassure you that it is absolutely a priority for us. And I, um, I, uh, I, I am committed to getting that done and getting it done in a really effective way and doing the most we can to deal with that cohort because I think it's critically important. I'm going to just take a couple more questions from the just audience. Just is this. All right, quickly, and then yeah. we'll take a couple more questions. Just to add, UNFPA has a strategy already. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's out there. We actually are on the ground working in 12 countries with the Adolescent Girls Initiative, where we actually take girls of, at the age of 9, 10, and build their agency with education, with skills development, making sure we create safe spaces for them. And we have just graduated a set of girls in Niger Republic, and this is working for us. And we're also part of the, there is an initiative that DFID is putting together, which would uh, debut next month in, uh, in, um, in London, and we're part of that. It's about mm -hmm. ending, uh, you know, uh, uh, child marriage and uh, forced marriage. Just, just to add. Thank you. Okay, a couple more questions. We'll take uh, one from over here. Let's see. Behind, uh, behind, in the white shirt, yeah. Uh, there's a microphone, and then we'll take one from the middle, and one more, and then we'll get some responses. Um, hi, my name is Arushi. I'm an independent consultant, and my question is to the panel in general. Now, gender-based violence in India is essentially a manifestation of patriarchal attitudes, which emphasize on the subjugation of women. Now, statistics show that intimate partner violence in India is more nuanced and rampant in higher socioeconomic strata of society. It goes unreported and is not addressed. And these women that we're talking about are aware of the law, they're educated. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are on how we might address this paradox in India. And I'm sure it's the case in a lot of other countries. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll take one from the middle, in the yellow sweater here. Good morning, I'm Frances Ash Goins from HHS Office on Women's Health. And I'm very interested in the issue of trafficking and trafficking in health and how it's addressed in your programs. And I'm giving this to all speakers. Thank okay. you. And we'll take one last question. Uh, we'll go in the back over there. Hi, I'm Clara Aleman. I work at the Inter-American Development Bank. And specifically, the question is for Dr. Osom Timehin. Sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly. When trying to support countries in uh, having their comprehensive sexual education and enhancing access to sexual and reproductive rights for adolescent girls and boys, meaning contraceptives and counseling, how, do, how does UNFPA uh, address the issue of religious institutions that have a very important role, even if ministries of health and education in their policies and programs might intend to, to do this, they find it very difficult to, um, well, to implement it in practice when institu religious institutions are very powerful. So I think what I'm gonna suggest is that we let each of the panelists respond to whichever these questions they would like to, but also wrap in some closing remarks uh, that address partly what these questions highlight, which are some of the enduring challenges and what are the next steps that need to happen from each of your institutions and from each of your perspectives uh, so that we can really advance this agenda. So why don't we start with Ambassador Russell. Um, we, the questions just again are on gender-based violence in India, trafficking, and the religious institutions. Uh, well, let me, let me address the, the India question because I think it really is, um, sort of encapsulates the, some of the issues that we're trying to, to deal with. And I think the, the challenging thing about India and the, and the really intriguing thing about it is that um, the cases that we've heard about recently have been so, um, so stark and so uh, really heartbreaking. And, 
and have really captured the attention, certainly, of people in the United States. But most interesting to me is, is the way they've captured the attention of, of people in the, in the country of India and the way people have really uh, reacted so strongly in the country and demanded some action on the, on the part of their um, political leaders there. And I've heard from many people in the country some um, anticipation about what the new government will do and how they're looking forward to some change in the, in the way the government will respond to some of these issues. So I think that, um, you know, I, I did spend some time in, in India recently, and I think it's a very, I mean, I don't have to tell you this, it's a very complicated country. There are many, um, there are many issues, um, class issues, caste issues, other, other issues that come to play. Um, there that are very, very challenging. Uh, but the one thing that I said to, to, to leaders that I met there is that in every country, you know, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, whatever, however you want to categorize it, um, comes into play. It, it is not an issue that any country has managed to, to solve. And that, as I said in my remarks, we come at this issue with a tremendous amount of humility. We have, we have spent many years on this, and the one thing that we've managed to do from the time I started working on it is, is change this from an issue that we treat as a, as a family matter to now treating it as a crime. And that is, that's a lot of progress, but we haven't solved the problem. So we are always offering, as, as we do it, we, really in every country that I go to, to say we will share our experiences, we're happy to do that. But it is not, this is, this is a persistent problem everywhere in the world. Um, I guess in terms of next steps, what I would say is, you know, we are looking, we are looking for all partners to come to us, share whatever experiences they have. Everyone has a role to play here. You know, there are many people who have just tremendous experience, and we're really interested in hearing it. Um, we again come at this with a lot of humility. We've got a lot of experience in the office. I, I came into a great team. I had a wonderful, amazing predecessor who did tremendous work. Secretary Clinton did an amazing amount of work, um, but you know we, we're we're pushing forward as quickly as we can. We we rely on private sector folks to help us, um, interest groups, many others. You know certainly our our other partners, amazing partners at the UN and other places. So we are you know really open to su suggestions and looking for opportunities to work together. And I think we've all got a, a lot of work to do. Uh, and I think if we can continue to work together, we'll make some progress going forward. Dr. Soti Mehan, last words and any response to these questions. Thank you, John. I, I, let me quickly add on to what uh, the ambassador said with regards to the complexities of the context that we deal with in different countries. But to offer one example, which I saw in Liberia. And, and I think that India is caught on in terms of legislation and pushing through judicial processes. In Liberia, what it did was create a parallel court system. And that court system must dispense judgment in six weeks. So if you are accused of gender-based violence, you, you go into that court system, in six weeks you will either be discharged or you will you'll be convicted. And what we saw was that in Metropolitan Morovia, the prevalence of gender-based violence dropped. So I think there has to be a specific push to make sure that impunity uh, is not uh, is not uh, tolerated. So that's that's one. Now the specific question I got, which was about uh, religious uh, institutions and other traditional institutions, uh, in terms of uh, uh, comprehensive sexuality education. I, I think that the best possible answer for you is to let me tell you what I did in Nigeria. So I think that's the only way that I can put this in the context. Nigeria, if you didn't know about it, I'm sure in the last two months you know now. Um, it's a very complex country, multi-ethnic and multi-religious. But when we tried to build CSC in Nigeria, what we did was we brought everybody to the table religious leaders, community leaders, government leaders, and we agreed on the content of what we wanted to expose young people to. So that content must, must uh, included the things like what they must know about their bodies, 
what they must know about their transition from childhood through adolescence to adulthood, what they must know about their vulnerabilities as they grow, and what are the things that they are exposed to, which in fact might affect their lives and, and uh, totally uh, take out their potential, HIV or, or pregnancy. We agreed on this. But I think we built that curriculum on that, and we also ensure that everybody agreed on it. Now, what it is called in different parts of Nigeria might differ, but the, the essence and the substance remain the same. And I want to tell you, of the 36 states in Nigeria, the first to adopt the curriculum was the most conservative northern Muslim state. Mm. So it, it, it's, it's, I think it's about, it's about making sure that everybody buys into it. It's about ensuring that everybody's on the table talking about it, and it's about ensuring that we all uh, have these, uh, uh, these, these issues which are totally uh, sensitive, but then, you know, they, 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 they are part of our nature, and we have to deal with it. Um, I, I, I will stop there. I was going to talk about trafficking, but I will let him talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Last word for you. Uh, I, actually, I'd like to speak, I won't speak specifically about India, but a different dimension than what you mentioned generically, which is that this is sometimes coming from higher status households. Um, I mean, this is proof of a larger concept, which is that um, norms are sticky, and they're not necessarily just the province of the poor or the ignorant or something else. Uh, in this country, for instance, there was actually far more openness to women in the workplace in the difficult years in the 20s and 30s than there was after World War II. Um, I know this because I lived this natural experiment when my mother was in one of the few professions that they were allowed, women were allowed to stay in after the war, which was teaching. Um, and I watched her relative to her cohort, most of whom were sent back to the kitchen and thwarted from their opportunity to develop. And it made a tremendous difference in the sort of life opportunities for me, frankly, and my peers. Um, but the point is that this is part of a larger uh, dynamic we see, that, that economic growth or household prosperity does not necess necessarily automatically correlate with enlightenment or expansion. This is why we need deliberate, proactive efforts to open up this space by creating more opportunity, by preferentially giving access, assets, opportunities to those who are being deprived. Because if we wait for it to happen organically, it can take a very long time. Um, and it's an important point that is relevant in most of the countries. But all of these issues that have come up, um, religion, norms, et cetera, point to the importance of local culture, obviously. And there's, a, there's a, a vast but limited amount that external partners, such as the World Bank and the UN system, the US can do uh, by ourselves. And we, what we need to do is be extremely sensitive to the local dynamics and tap into the openness of leaders, because there are always leaders who are more open than others, um, and let them figure out the most appropriate way to adapt this to local circumstance. The example the Prof just gave, um, some of the successful examples of eliminating female genital mutilation, which involved engaging the elders who were sustaining the practice, many of whom were women in these countries, um, and finding the way in with them, rather than coming in with something one size fits all. But again, that's why a comprehensive um, and highly tailored approach is necessary. And that's why on the bank side, we're gonna be looking to meet each practice in each area on its own terms to say, all right, how can we frame this in a way that will help you achieve your goals at the same time that we're helping to achieve everything that we're here about today. So thank you very much. Really look forward to working with both of you and all of our partners. Well, please join me in thanking this very excellent panel. I wish we had more time. <laughs>